Hey, how's it going? Let's talk about middle evolutions. Now I bet if you found a random person on the streets that didn't know anything about Pokemon, you explained the basic concept of it to them, and then showed them a Nidoran and a Nidoking, they could probably guess the predictable and uninspired Nidorino, and I apologize to that one person that requested Nidorino and it's their favorite Pokemon, but the fact of the matter is it's just kind of boring, and that goes for pretty much most of the middle stage Pokemon. In my own personal opinion, there are only only three middle stage Pokemon that I think stand out from the base or final forms. Dragonair is one of the most majestic Pokemon there is, and if Dragonite didn't exist, this Pokemon would still be great. I also think Chargebug has a fantastic design, and it's a great take on the bug, cocoon, and then winged bug trope. The third is obviously War Turtle. This Pokemon is definitely undervalued in terms of design. The winged ears and the feathery tidal wave tail make it stand out, and it was just kind of requested a lot, and since I I haven't done either Squirtle or Blastoise yet, this will be a unique experience that'll help with those runs as well. Now there will be some changes today guys, I have my live updating layout and I talked about it in my previous vlog along with some of the visual changes. There will be a lot more information available to us on the screen, so go back and watch that if you're kind of confused. Now also guys don't forget that I've been in the hyperbolic time chamber for what felt like the real life equivalent of a year, playing on times 4 speed for a Scott's Thoughts pair sec race and I'm interested to see how my experiences with that will affect my play on this one and I think you'll definitely want to see that. But before we begin I would like to quickly say that I do Pokemon solo run content often and if that sounds like it's something that might be interesting to you consider subscribing to be kept up to date. Likes and comments really are what help fuel the algorithm and you guys have helped me out a lot and if you are a regular viewer or maybe you're new or maybe you're just someone that never thinks about commenting at all well you should just scroll down and this this week I'm going to pose a question instead of a word. I was a huge Ninja Turtle fan in the 90s and if you like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, tell me which one was your favorite. I personally was a diehard Raphael fan, but if you didn't watch, just say I like turtles. Job, what do you think? I like turtles. Because I'll use any excuse to get that video clip on my screen in my videos. And with that out of the way, just sit back, relax, and let's see how this one goes. Right from the start, I set War Turtle as my starter via the Universal Pokemon Randomizer, and today's name is obviously going to be Raphael. With the Gamehook software, I can set my DVs and nickname without using third-party software, and we can just kind of get straight into it. I also want to say up front that I committed a sin, guys. I'm a complete noob, and my mouse cursor is present on this video, so please cut me some slack. It's been a hectic month, but you can still comment below if you care enough about it. Now, as for the rival fight, there's not much to say. It's annoying if you get growled, but tail whips can offset that and get you past. And I don't want to gush too hard on the software, but I do want to point out things throughout the video. The first thing here is that I want you to notice the effect the growl has on my attack. The little negative six indicates that my attack has been lowered six stages in this fight, and I finished the battle with a whopping three attack. Now moving forward, it's all minimum battles, because as a water type, Brock is just going to be as easy as you expect it to be. Bubble isn't the strongest move ever, but water against Brock's Pokemon is exactly how you think it's going to go. It's very fast, it's very painless, and just like that, there's no need to dwell on the start of the game anymore. After the battle, I get the Boulder Badge and the Attack Badge Boost. Now that's not news to anyone that watches my videos, but I want you to notice the little Boulder Badge icon next to my attack. My attack is now 12.5 percent higher and if you pay attention to the stats you'll see the badge boost happen in real time and this software is amazing but let's keep moving on. On the way to Cerulean the only thing to mention is that Mega Punch is key coming up. You'll also learn Water Gun here but the pivotal thing is to not forget Tail Whip. Things will be a lot harder if you do so keep it. Jumping straight into Misty and this is where things get a little bit tedious. The idea here is simple. Our water typing means that she'll only use Tackle against us with Tail Whip and 
Mega Punch, we should be able just to push through. Now in my practice runs, this wasn't really that bad, but here I actually have a lot of problems. Both Pokemon just love to crit, and when they get X defend, it's really hard to keep pace with Starmie's damage. I'm going to cut a long story short here because there's simply not a whole lot to say about this fight, but I do have to spend a whopping 6 resets here before getting past, and this is what's interesting about in-game time versus real life time runs that I pretty much spent that last month doing. To make this one consistent, you would likely have to face several more trainers on the way here, or go ahead and do rival number 2 first, and that would alleviate the problems, but for my rule set, I can just save here, and all it's really going to cost me is stacking up a little resets, and I'm fine with that. Afterward, we do get Bubble Beam, and it's a very powerful, stabbed early game move, and it's very necessary to speed up the next segment of the game. I often talk about how Nugget Bridge contains about 15% of the total fights in the entire game, so speeding that up was the goal here, and that's what you should try to do on every single run you do. Now, as for rival number two, it's an easy one shot. I do actually take a sand attack on the Pidgey Yoto's second turn, but the rest of the battle is very trivial. It feels good because this fight in the Parasect race runs that I was doing on the yellow version was probably the hardest fight in the entire game, and I'm all for this one being easy after a month of suffering through resets here. I will say that I did pick up a few bad habits playing so much yellow version. Here I forget to escape rope after bills, and I have to actually run back in. I have a few moments like this littered throughout the run, and it made me feel pretty rusty honestly, but that's fine. But first, here's an here's an awful reset. I forget to heal, and I hastily fight the Dig Rocket Grunt. I lose the fight, which isn't really that big of a deal, but my bad Parasect habit strike again, and I hadn't saved since I fought rival number two. It's annoying, but it is what it is, and let's just keep it rolling. Now, outside of getting access to Dig, we can pick back up in Vermilion City, and I have kind of a new shopping setup here. In the Polyrath video, I had a new one than that one too. I was picking up my entire stock of repels for the entirety of the run, but here there's a slightly more efficient way that I've found. Instead, I stock up on some super potions, and I just pick up 10 repels to last me until my big bind Celadon. I pick up Body Slam, and then I grab the rare candy guarded by the gentleman, and from here I easily smash through rival number 3 with no issues from all of our new fancy moves. Afterward, it's time for Surge, and this one did give me a lot of trouble in my test runs, but remember guys, we have access to the super effective dig. What this fight essentially is going to come down to is if Raichu wants to go for Thunderbolt on its first turn, and here it doesn't, and I just went on the first attempt. Originally I thought I would need more levels here, or even have to use a rare candy, but it turned out to go very smooth, and we can just keep on moving along. From there we can just skip over Rock Tunnel and pick back up in the Celadon segment, and this is where my Parasect runs were so different. In the Scott's Thoughts rule set, we were able to use the Pokedaw to skip the Rocket Hideout and bypass the Marowak and the Pokemon Tower, and this meant that you had to visit the Celadon Pokemon here early, and if you followed my previous videos, you know that I love to hold off buying here until later where I can afford the maximum amount of vitamins, and that was definitely one of the biggest adjustments that I had to make this past month. Now outside of doing that, inside the Rocket Hideout, I do learn Withdrawal at level 31 for the future badge boost, and the Giovanni fight here just, it's really easy, we don't have to talk about it really. The same thing also goes for rival number four. It's very skippable, but I will just go ahead and say quickly that it's nice to see Gyarados make its return. Pokemon Red and Blue are much harder early in the game than Yellow, and I feel like most people just give credit to Yellow for having a better late game, but I think it's definitely worth noting that I don't have a great answer for Gyarados at this time, and I never will, and that's all I have to really say. After Pokemon Tower, I would like to talk about a tiny little efficiency change that I made through my quest to become the Parasect Champion. Menuing is bad, you don't want to do it a lot, so you want to combine a lot of stuff. So when I go to use the Poke Flute on Snorlax, I use a Repel in that same menu, and then this allows me to not get any encounters when I'm getting the Hidden Rare Candy. And let me just toot my own Poke Flute here and say that I've gotten extremely good at picking up hidden items this last month. Look how silky smooth this is. I pick up the Flight Path and Fuchsia, and I get the final HMs of the run. 
Surf is a nice upgrade here, and now I can return to Celadon for my one market visit like I usually do. I fall just short of six vitamins, and I could have routed this better. I could have even went up to the top floor and bought some HMs to sell, but I think that's incredibly slow, and I think that's why some people are not going to win the race. That's neither here nor there. I do opt to go with five calciums to sure up my special stat later in the game, and we can now continue into that mid game. Our first obstacle is Koga, and I lose miserably on the first attempt. The combination of accuracy moves and poison just does me in before I can really do anything and I don't even make it past his second Pokemon. The second attempt, I do make it to the very end, but at this point I'm already poisoned. I do make an executive decision that my win condition here was to just use withdrawal and hope that it uses self-destruct early, but Weezing just chips me down and goes for the self-destruct at the end to cause me another reset. I'd also like to quickly call out some behavior with the end game time that I've noticed now that I have this software. Notice how the end game time starts ticking as soon as I get into this continue menu and if you just let this sit here it would just add up the time even though you're not technically in the game. Now if you just sit here too long you can just start a new game, reset, and then continue. It's just kind of an interesting little quirk with the end game time I thought I'd bring up real quick. And finally on this attempt, Koga acts right. I just surf down his first three Pokemon and on the Weezing I get toxic put on me. This one gets a little dicey but I hold strong. I use withdraw I'm just waiting for a self destruct and that's what happens I'm able to take the fight I'm also able to get that sweet speed badge boost as indicated with the soul badge icon next to my speed look how good it looks from there I anchor myself in saffron by healing at the center and now it's time for a nice colorful swim down to cinnabar I don't battle any extra trainers and after a ninja turtle edition of Tombstoner, brother. It's time for Blaine. There's no secret why I rushed her as soon as I could. Super effective moves against a gym leader with bad AI is the recipe for a very easy fight, and just going ahead and coming here to get the special badge boost just means that we'll be stronger later in the fights coming up. There's really not much to say about this one. It's fairly easy like you'd expect. Now it's time for Silco, and here's something that some of you might have known, but if this was news to me, and if I played the game as much as I have, and I didn't know it, some of you probably won't either. On the third floor, there's a rocket with two radicates and a Hypno, and it's actually not a mandatory battle. On the fifth floor, after you pick up the card key, you can open up the little panel next to the Arbok Grunt, use that warp panel and you can just completely bypass it. So it was just some good information that I thought I'd share with you real quick. Now it's time for rival number five. And here's where I sort of messed up my routing a little bit. The first attempt honestly looks pretty great. I'm able to progress easily, but I know I'll level up at some point. Now the problem is I hit level 41 going into the Alakazam. And since Gyarados just chips me down before that, it makes things very difficult and I have to reset. The solution here is to battle this scientist right here. I like to call him the self-destruct scientist scientist and alliteration always sounds nice. I'm hoping this little bit of experience can manipulate our level so we don't have to grind but let's see how it turns out. And it turns out to be perfect because I level up on the Growlithe now. I do get really low here but notice the combination of it using tail whips and me using withdrawals lets me do an absurd amount of badge boost and I want you guys to get the first time the visualization of my stats. It's really cool that we get to see the effects in real time and I want you guys to really appreciate how boosted out of its mind my war turtle is. I have over 400 in every stat basically and that's kind of nutty for this low in the game. And with stats like that there's no doubt that it's going to be an easy sweep from here on out and I take the fight very easy. If I had to redo the run for more consistency I would say that going ahead and fighting Erica before this gym even if I had to reset a couple of times would probably put me in a better experience range but that's just me kind of talking I don't really care that much to redo the whole run again. Now let's skip over the pathetic Giovanni number two fight and jump straight into Sabrina. Now this one is pretty scary. I feel like I'm going to level up so I don't set up. It's dangerous anyway on the Kadabra and it's going fairly well until I get the Venomoth. Predictably I get paralyzed and things are just looking kind of grim when the Alakazam hits me with some pretty nice damage but I actually squeak this one out. I hit a body slam, I paralyze it, it gets a fully paralyzed proc and then I take it out. This one was dicey, it was very close, but there's no need to go into any more detail. Now finally, I can go back and pick up Erica, and at this point, I'm monologuing to myself to not forget Strength and Fuchsia. I do that a lot. Since we saved Erica for the end, there's one major lose condition here, and that's getting put to sleep. And what you know it, that's exactly what happens. I get put to sleep, I get my ass beat, 
and that's another reset. The second attempt goes much better. I crit on Dig, but I don't think it would have mattered. I could tank a Razor Leaf if I needed to, and I just go on from there to sweep through the fight, and I take out the seventh badge of the run. Now let's quickly get through this final Giovanni fight and the eighth badge. I don't even need to set up here. That's how weak it is. Yellow Giovanni is much tougher, but we all know that. Surf here can just take out everything, and there's not much more to say. Now friends, this is where I had some trouble on the run. War Turtle has an excellent leveling group. That combined with me being a lower level, makes this little portion of the game something that I really underestimated. Now this fight looks perfect from the start. Pidgeot's not an issue, I take it out quick, and I level up to 47. Now this looks like the perfect opportunity to set up on the Rhyhorn, but I make a blunder and I take it out, I don't set up at all. I'm thinking that I can just blast my way through the next couple of Pokemon, and then I'll just set up on the Growlithe, but Gyarados has other plans, it gets me low, and then I eventually fall to the Growlithe. But it's no problem, right? I'll just redo it, I can just set up on the horn and things will be gravy right and things are looking really good I do just that I'm able to easily sweep through the fight but I level up to 48 on the Venusaur and without the badge boost I really don't stand a chance and that's a re another reset the solution here seems very simple on the surface just use a rare candy I won't level up and then I'll just win the fight and this is where the run would have fell apart if I was using real life time now one candy was kind of a dumb move I already knew that even if I leveled up to 47 in the middle of the fight, I would still hit 48, and my brain lapse cost me another reset. I then try at level 48, and it's the same result. I level up to 49 going into the Venusaur. Now we go up to 49, and I think you already know what's going to happen here. I hit level 50 going into the Venusaur, and I have to reset once again. Now I'm at level 50, and I'm still hitting level 51 going into the Venusaur, and it's honestly getting a little bit ridiculous now. And finally guys, after trying so many levels, using my candies, I get up to level 51, and that finally allows me to not level up. I keep all those delicious stats, and I take the fight. The reset count is getting kind of high, but look at my in-game time. It's actually looking pretty good, but we'll talk about that later when the time comes. Now, I swiftly make my way through Victory Road, and let's not waste any time and jump straight into the Elite Four. I use all but three of my rare candies, and I start Lorelei at level 54. The goal of this fight, and the perfect version of it, would be to not take a grab and then set up some boost and then just sweep with body slam. Now I fail pretty quickly and it's kind of a boring fight honestly. I take a growl this time so Surf does do the job just fine and I'm able to slowly slog my way through this fight with some decent damage. I get a little bit low but considering that I had to use Surf against water types because of the attack drop it really wasn't that bad and I still won. It was a turn one victory so I'm not complaining but there is something that I didn't see coming here. I had skipped an elixir earlier on accident. I meant to tell you guys about a new elixir I pick up, but I forgot. And using so many surfs here means that something bad is about to happen on Bruno. I'm almost out of surfs, so on the Hitmonlee, I'm like, well, I'll just, I'll just set up and we'll just make it through this fight. But I get too low and I get taken out, and I'm honestly embarrassed for my past self. I make it back on the next attempt, and this time I don't have to waste all my surfs on uh, Lorelei. I set up a few times, and I'm able just to sweep through the fight like the good lord intended and we can just ignore that last reset don't mention it next up is agatha and if war turtle has any major shortcomings it's the fact that it has no status conditions i'm not gonna deep dive into this fight i will say that the game hook software lets me be able to look up the fact that i need 138 speed to outspeed the first gengar and 145 for the final one so that's the goal with the badge boost it's just a really hard fight to find a place to set up i do last a really really long time in this first attempt, but it's honestly the gold bat that causes me issues. The confusion status combined with multiple, it felt like you did about 35 different hazes. It just means that I'll never hit the boost required to sweep the fight, and even though I put in a pretty valiant effort, I just eventually go down, and that's the 19th reset of the run. On the second attempt, there's an early aggressive swap to gold bat, and I have no choice but to set up. It's annoying, but eventually I am able to get a few to stick, and I get some body slams, and notice my speed is 151 and from what I just mentioned that means it's high enough to outspeed anything on our team. This means that with the annoying haze threat out of the way there's nothing left to stop me from digging a bunch of turtle holes and ultimately sweeping through the fight 
Now this one was annoying like Agatha tends to be, but only having to reset once on her in this run to get past really wasn't that bad. Going into Lance, I replaced Dig with Blizzard before going in, and let's see how that goes. Gyarados is living up to its menace status today. I'm getting beams thrown at me, I'm getting rages thrown at me, and I'm running extremely low on HP. It's to the point where I can't even fully set up here. I do as much as I can, but I can only get to plus four, and I go to all the way down to 11 health before seeing if I can maybe work some of that map magic. And that magic, my friends, is Blizzard. It only has a 90% chance to hit, and I can't afford to miss more than once, but what ends up happening is I outspeed everything, I toss some snow around, and it's a very easy win despite being so low at the start. Now it's time for the champion battle, and some deja vu might play out here. Now let's not look that far ahead, and let's just take a look at the first attempt. First up is Pidgeot. It has all physical moves, and War Turtle has nice bulk on top of a defensive badge boosting move, so this is the ideal place to set up. There's little danger of taking a ton of damage here, and this one is overall pretty free. Now I'm very boosted at this point, and from there I can outspeed and one-shot the Alakazam, the Rhydon, Gyarados and Arcanine and things are looking very smooth until a very familiar problem strikes again. Guys, I level up to 61 on the Venusaur and I lose all those beautiful boosts. Blizzard does still do decent damage, but two Mega Drains ultimately takes me out for another reset. Now this one was still pretty close to spot leveling up, so let's just not make any adjustments and make our way back. We get back and it's the same thing. I level up at 61, but this time I pull a little bit of that matte look out of the hat, I hit the free status on my first turn, and this means that Venusaur's poor and little helpless frog butt can do nothing as I take it out in the next turn, and I finish the battle, and I finalize the run, and War Turtle has done it. I know you guys are looking at the time, and it is pretty amazing, but let me skip ahead and I'll show you guys the exact frame that I'll be judging my run zone from here on out. I didn't deposit my HM Pokemon, so I will be editing them out, so if you see a little time jump, that's that's why, but let's just see those stats. War Turtle finishes with a level of 61, 20 resets, and a very impressive in-game time of 2 hours, 40 minutes, and 16 seconds. I'm not going to use milliseconds here, I feel like it's not necessary, and the frame that I judge the time on is as soon as the time hits right here. Now before we talk any further, I'm going to add in some bonus footage to make up for that mouse cursor noob mistake. I'm going to start showing the run beating me too from now on. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. You gotta, you guys gotta tell me if you want this or not. And notice how it took me 15 additional resets to get past it. I end up having to cheese this fight and freeze it because at level 61, this fight was not fun. I really didn't stand a chance. Now as far as the run goes, let me tell you guys a little something. Before I started doing those times 4 speed Parasect runs, I had War Turtle footage recorded on my old emulator before I went into the hyperbolic time chamber. My final time, my best time for those videos, that footage, was 2 hours and 55 minutes. This means that even making some mistakes in this run, I was able to cut out a whopping 15 minutes off of its time. Now obviously, the implication here is that I've become so efficient at the game that every single one of my older runs might have now become obsolete. The prospect that I could potentially save 15 minutes on every single run that I've ever done makes me a little bit sad, but let's keep it positive here because when I can finally stream, we can start to chip away at some of those older runs and see how they would do with my new skill set. Now for now, I'll add in War Turtle to the fourth slot, pretty impressive time, and I'm going to go ahead and add in a reset counter even though no one else has that metric yet, because eventually we will build back up the tier list with my newfound proficiency, and overall, I just thought War Turtle was pretty fantastic. Now with this run done, it does really make me curious about how Squirtle can do on the pre-evolved list, and how much better could Blastoise be? Now more than anything, this run gave me more questions than answers, but I'm going to keep chipping away at the newer runs and not think too hard about how maybe Mewtwo could have like a 2 hour and 5 minute run, or maybe something like Nidoking could hit that 2 hour 20 minute mark. I'm not going to think about it right now. Now we'll see if this trend continues next week, but I hope you guys enjoyed the new layout, and I'm really sorry about the mouse cursor. It was a very rookie mistake, and I'm just, I'm finishing up moving. Uh, no excuses here, but it's been a really busy summer.
humor for me, so cut me some slack, bitch. But that's all I have for you guys. I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your week, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye!